Recorded live from the secret underground lair of Crimson Cowl Comics and Collectible, this is the Crimson Cowl Comic Club Podcast. The following issues may contain spoilers. There's no wasteland here. I'm Anthony. I'm Kirby. I'm Katie. And I'm Jim. Welcome to issue number 291 of the Crimson Cowl Comic Club podcast. Every time we record, we talk about comic books. This week, we do have a club discussion for our uh, series here called Once Upon a Time at the End of the World with issue number 11 of 15 at the moment. Uh, we'll see if they extend that again, but it, it's sounding like this is going to be wrapping up based on uh, recent interviews and synopsis and everything. Um, right. After the club discussion, we're going to jump into the weekly reviews. That's where we talk about the books that we've been reading, whether they're new, whether they're old. We're going to talk about them there. And that is going to be the lineup for our show. So let's jump right into it with the club discussion. All right. Once upon a time at the end of the world issue number 11 from their initial meet cute in the wasteland to the paradise oasis they built in adulthood. Everything in Maceo and Mezzi's story has led to this. Torn asunder by the events of the critically acclaimed Book 2, each faces old age and unforgiving end of all things, isolated on a planet breathing its last breaths. But fate has other plans for these star-crossed lovers, as they will be reunited one last time, with nothing less than the fate of the entire world at stake. This comic is done by Jason Aaron, Nick Dragota, uh, Rico Renzi, just want to double check that, yep, Rico Renzi, Alexandre Tefenki, Lee Loridge, Leila Del Duca, Tamara Bonvillain, and And World Design. All right, uh, this is kicking off chapter one of this uh, third book of this series. Uh, the first book of the series dealing with uh, the characters being young and meeting and kind of having two different kind of life paths of survival and joining up and falling, uh, basically uh, leading to falling in love, which uh, book two uh, showed a lot of loving going on, uh, as we talked on this past show here, talking about them finding their community, their their safe place, their you know their little commune basically, and having all these people come in and and find protection against the elements of the uh, apocalypse. And uh, we saw a lot of bad things happening at the end of that arc and dealing with, uh, you know, uh, disease, you know, the, this mystery gas that was going around and, you know, kind of messing with people, possessing people. And there's just a lot of stuff that eventually led to our uh, two main characters to separate. And we pick up from that moment where they had decided where they were kind of split from um you know, on the edges of the world there, there was a big, uh, big crack in the earth and they were on opposite sides and basically uh, decided to split and go on their own ways. And that's where we kind of pick up as we kind of see that moment leading into our future uh, version of these characters as we've um, teased throughout the book, mostly in the first book of uh, teasing their uh, ultimate uh, future scenarios. And we see a lot more of that a uh, very gruesome book, uh, probably the most violent, I would say, and graphic that we've seen so far, really kind of leaning into that apocalyptic, uh, just mayhem and bloodshed and all that stuff. And we just kind of see what happened to these two characters and essentially what might bring them back together. So that is kind of the overall tease of what's going on with issue number 11 um, I will kick it off with Jim first, if you want to uh, talk about your thoughts for Once Upon a Time at the End of the World, issue number 11. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, this was a great uh, issue. It really brought the story forward. Um, I, I've been saying pretty much since we first saw that glimpse of him, I wanted to know more about Old Man Mace. And we really got a bunch of that here. We really got a bunch of naked old man mace. Yeah, you definitely saw a lot. Um, a lot more than you really want to or need to, but yeah, it's there. <laughs> um, 
And uh, yeah, I, there is, you know, like I said, really moves the story forward. There is a passage in here that I really love. I'm actually going to read it. And it occurs um, right after uh, Mace and Mezzi find themselves on either side of this huge schism that happened when their paradise blew up. Um, and he says, oh, no. And then the text boxes are forever sized. That was how big it felt. The ulcerous emptiness suddenly gaping inside him. A hole the size of forever. And just like that, the sales shell sock subsided. I mean, Jason Aaron, great, <laughs> great passage. Yep, there, Anthony's got the page for us. Yeah, so um, just I imagine the feeling he was going through. And it was like to feel that. And then all of a sudden, boom, you have to turn it off because you need to survive. Yeah, and, and that moment just cutting right into, you know, the old man version and just kind of continuing that walking path and just kind of seeing the horrors that he's existing now is just pretty crazy. Um, anything else to add on to that? Or? Um, I think the summary pretty much covered it. What I like, you know, are they going to get back together? Is there a possibility? You know, at least we see there's something. Um, I'm having trouble. I could see this wrapping up in one more issue. I don't know where they're going to go. There's got to be something else if they're still planning on 15 issues that's coming in. But um, I'm here for it, though. Excellent. Let's jump over to Katie. Thoughts on issue number 11. Um, honestly, this wasn't my thing. I didn't really enjoy it. Um, you know, I, I do think they did a good job moving the story forward. And there were definitely some moments where Mezzi was being a total badass and that was super cool. But yeah, this wasn't my jam. Yep. That, that right there, that was awesome. Um, for me, I felt like the end of the last arc was a pretty satisfying ending, and this serves as, like, an epilogue. Um, but, yeah, it wasn't my thing. I may or may not go on since we're reading it with the club, but this was, uh, just too graphic for me, so. Yeah, it's understandable, because as I was going through this, just being like, all right, kind of like how our reactions to book two was you know, a different experience than what we read in book one. And now we're almost getting mm -hmm. similar, like, hard shift into just jumping into the horror element and just really getting bloody and gloomy. Yeah. We had those little teases in that that very first book, but uh, this is really, you know, leaning into it as the, the end of whatever story they're telling here. But yeah. Yeah. It's understandable. Yeah. Thank you. And then I, I read an all ages book for my weekly review. So that was a huge talk about jumping and having different experiences, but we'll get to that in the weeklies. But, um, you know, I, I appreciate their creativity and I know a lot of people really do like, you know, post-apocalyptic stories. So if you are into that and you're okay with an R rated version of that, you'd probably really like this, but, uh, not me. So we'll see how next time goes. All right. That's who's right. next? I think that's good for the discussion too, just to kind of kind of keep getting these uh, you know, differing mm -hmm. views and everything. That's what makes a, a good comic club and a good book club. Yeah. Um I I did like all of the, you know, the action and everything. Um, I was very much intrigued. Even though this is spoilers and everything, um, I'm still gonna leave that last page uh as a secret for people that uh wanna reveal what's going on but kind of revealing a, a new character if you will and that is what i am very intrigued by to kind of see how this character came to be uh even though i haven't seen and I, they're on my list but like the mad max movies the fury road and all that stuff i get vibes of mad max fury road with what this issue has done whether or not that is accurate like i said i actually haven't seen those but knowing what i know based on the trailers and their the what they wear and just kind of the element of of those movies i think this would probably appeal to fans of that um and maybe this is just steps ahead of that as far as like the gruesome and the blood but um um but yeah i i, I liked uh, that last character being introduced 
is what intrigues me to read forward and find out, you know, where this character came from, you know, and how this character turned out to be the way that they did. Um, like I said, it's, it, it was a pretty great moment that even in a spoiler discussion, I didn't really want to go into details on that one until the next issue. But overall, uh, I would say I'm pretty much on par with Jim when it comes to uh, enjoying this issue. And um, I guess ultimately I'm excited to see it end just because knowing that there is a conclusion. And at this point, I know when it started, I'm like, oh, I'd probably read a hundred issues of this. Like it's the walking dead. And then, you know, opinions started to change and just being like, all right, now I got pretty satisfied knowing that there was a, a ending in the near future. So, so yeah. Uh, any other uh, thoughts at all about this issue? Jim was holding yeah. up. Yep. I don't think I would enjoy this if it wasn't ongoing. Um, there has been a little bit too much up and down um, rather than an even pacing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And while I'm not upset by like the violence or the sex or the nudity, you know, there has been sometimes a little bit more than it needed to be to provide for the story. Mm-hmm. I agree with Great. that. Absolutely. Um, sometimes, you know, just a little bit of horror or a little bit of violence was all you need to provide the horror. So true, true. But yeah. Um, and, and like I said, you know, yeah, they got this new character or characters in there, but um, I don't think they necessarily have to be a uh, three or four arc <laughs> or book arc. Yeah. And either, you know. Yeah, unless they just go back to like, you know, treat it as flashback issues and do more of yeah. that. Just saying, oh, this is how this character, you know, came to be in the early life of the character. Like, I guess time will tell as we wait for the next issues, but all right. Um, so, yeah, that is uh, going to do it then for issue number 11 of Once Upon a Time at the End of the World. Uh, future club discussions are uh, Tales from the North, The Dungeon, which is the one shot that is done by our friends David Gloyd and David Gloyd II here at Crimson Call Media. And they have uh, made their own comic book that I always have nearby, but it's on a pile right now that I am unearthing here. And here it is. So if you want to get yourself a copy of this, you can go to crimsoncowl.com and check out some free web comics involving these characters and also reach out uh, within the contact pages to get a copy of this brand new story that's only for print. So what you see on the website is different than what I'm holding here. Or you can uh, visit us at Milwaukee Mighty Con uh, that is happening. Go to mightyconshows.com for information. That is on set Saturday, February 10th. And I'll probably drop this episode a little sooner than I normally would just to get that little extra promotion. Otherwise, we have been promoting for the last couple of weeks. So that will be an eventual club discussion. I'll talk with those guys a little more there and make sure uh, when we can uh, hash that out. Um, then the Ape Real Special from DC Comics, the ape-centric uh, story that they're doing with the uh, option of a banana-scented variant cover that I'm very excited for. We'll try to uh, do a, a proper audio and video review of a smell when that book comes out. So that is coming out for the Ape Real Special. All right, that is going to do it for the club discussion. Let's move on to the next segment, which is the weekly reviews. First up for me is Teen Titans Go to the Library, an all-new original graphic novel that goes beyond the hit animated series. There's no superheroics allowed in the library. All Raven wanted was a little peace and quiet, and the local library seemed like the perfect place to find that. But her teammates know all her tricks, and when they catch up to her, all heck breaks loose. It's not all their fault. It's not their fault. There's a villain on the loose, and that villain has a dastardly plot, and it could only happen at the library. When the teens get scattered into the library books, first they have to figure out what happened, then they have to find each other, then they have to find the real Jump City. It's all in a day's work for our heroes, not their normal day's work, which involves a lot of punching and posing. This is more like a reader's day's work. You know, the fun kind. This book is done by Franco, Art Balthazar, Agnes Garbowska, Silvana Breeze, Zach Atkinson, and Wes Abbott. 
All right. This was announced quite a while ago as a super advanced solicit. Um, it was news that Art and Franco were holding on to for quite a while, talking about that they were going to be doing something big at DC. And um, they always have a bunch of secrets going. So who knows? There might even be more. But this is the Teen Titans go to the library. Now, they're famous for doing the Tiny Titans for a 50 issue plus epic run that they did. Back in, I want to say, what, 2008 to 2012-ish, maybe? Whatever the math would be, I think, in that era. And uh, now they get to play with the characters again, but in a new format by doing uh, playing with the older versions of the Teen Titans, uh, going from the Tiny Titans to the Teen Titans proper, um, but having them in that Teen Titans Go style of uh, universe. And this is a brilliant story. While there's a lot of names that worked on this book, um, the majority of the work here was done by Franco when it comes to the writing and the art. Um, this is a this is like a major piece to uh, show off everything that Franco is capable of because you see so many of his different art styles and this is just brilliant. So as the synopsis mentioned, um, the Teen Titans are basically trapped into uh, a library and they get trapped into all these different library books, all because uh, Beast Boy and Cyborg had wanted, uh, um, they're looking for Raven and they wanted uh, her powers to get a, a pizza teleported to them immediately, even though the pizza place is just right down the street. But that's too much work to call and do that and, and for Beast Boy to turn into a cheetah and run <laughs> and carry the pizza back. There was all these funny little setups to see like why they needed Raven to teleport a pizza. And that ultimately led to them finding her at the library and causing her to kind of flip out because she just wanted some peace and quiet. And uh, that basically sent everybody off into different books. Now to kind of tease everything that's going on is that everyone's kind of put into their own little artistic style, mostly done by Franco. Um, Franco here has uh, Raven going into uh, Edgar Allan Poe uh, universes, uh, dealing with uh, the Raven and such. Um, Love it. We have Robin going into a Shakespeare world. So we see some Macbeth stuff that's going on in there, and we see a shift in the mm -hmm. tone when it comes to the art. So now you're getting some black and white, you're dealing with some skulls, you're dealing with a lot of uh, extra poetic stuff, a lot of Macbeth type references. Um, you have Beast Boy, who's kind of suddenly uh, lost inside the pages of a book. As you see him, he's peeling up one of the pages right there. A little more on that later as I kind of tease where everybody goes. Starfire gets put into a book of paintings, as you see a very uh, Van Gogh, Starry Night type of uh, style going on there. So here's a more double pl double splash page kind of representation showing off uh the world that she kind of goes into cyborg goes into this book of blueprints which is very fitting for this kind of you know this character and it kind of turns into like an activity book of sorts there's some fun stuff that happens with mazes and kind of things that you would find in like the highlights magazine you know like oh, okay. you have some elements thrown into that into those blueprints there to add a little extra fun um and it's fun to kind of constantly go through all these styles when you're jumping from character to the character. They're all basically on the search for something that is off in their book that uh, a little connective tissue that is going to allow them to try to escape the book. I won't go into details upon that, but the majority of the story is dealing with them trapped in these books and figure out how to get out. I will show one more little tease of Beast Boy because that was only a little teaser of what where he ended up. And uh, he's basically in some kind of like paper book, like paper construction activity type of book. So you see a lot of stuff with like origami and scissors and stuff like that. Oh. So it gets very interesting playing around with all these different styles and Franco and his art styles and his colorist and everything like that. There's just a lot of, this is totally Franco right here. Just Franco is just loves doing all these uh working with color and everything and just because it happens to be right behind me i'm going to reach up and uh i don't know if i ever revealed this on this show or not but i showed it to franco when he was on cartoonist by night um mm -hmm. just to kind of show off franco's work here 
here is a uh, a spider woman painting that i had bought from him and just seeing just like he just loves experimenting with all of his work um he finds himself drawing a lot of spider woman characters just for the fact that he likes that character but this book is a great example of him getting to just play with every kind of art style he can imagine and then uh like i said agnes garboska has some uh designs uh some art in here and uh with having art Balthazar attached the last thing i will tease is that the the teen titans return to the tiny titans days with an all-new story and we get to see it's a long story it's not like it's just like a two-page in and out type of thing there's a lot of stuff that they get to play with here um we see starro into the story but uh Mm -hmm. it's so awesome to see uh you know, Art and Franco get to play with, you know, the characters in the series that ultimately kind of really put them on the map beyond their career own work. And uh, this is this was an excellent way for that to happen. Uh, this book in itself, I got a lot of similar vibes to Franco's last outing at DC, which was the Dead Man Tells the Scary Spooky Tales, because like all of these, they're on their own little separate adventures. Um you don't need a lot of information going in, you know, they don't deep, they don't go deep diving into crazy DC lore where you're just lost. Anything that's being brought up is, you know, is just done very naturally. And, and the main part of the story is flexing all of the different art styles that Franco gets to play with in here and the other artists that contributed. Um, This was something that, you know, I'm not a big titan's head i'm not a big dc comics person but you know i've enjoyed you know the work they've done i didn't expect to love this as much as i did and that's all because of franco's just ever growing and ever constant flow of art so that is my take on that kirby uh you had also read it so if you want to uh jump in and give your thoughts on this yeah i loved it i love when they do that little all the different art styles like they did with Sven Gulli's book and stuff that was different artists whereas this was these guys working on it showing their different abilities I'd say Beast Boy was probably my favorite one I love the whole paper aspect him trying to change into different beast but yet he's still a piece of paper so it doesn't matter when scissors is chasing up after him and stuff but yeah those are a lot of a lot of great different varieties cyborg with the blueprint style being put into a blueprint works all perfect with his mechanical ability and stuff and then the painted one it's just yeah there was so much variety in there it was definitely a nice show of all the different styles and then in the very back we get a little teaser for Barkham Asylum yes. which is a book I, I passed on because I was debating on it and now after reading that I gotta get it so that yeah. was a fun little story too in there <laughs> Now I have this on pre-order, so I just skipped through it. I didn't read it, but uh, but yeah, I do have this coming. This is from a different creative team, even though this seems like it would be an Art and Franco thing. But uh, but yeah, I think if you like any of these DC Kids books and the stuff we've talked about here on the show, that I think the Parkham Asylum is probably going to be uh, pretty entertaining as well. But yeah. if- and it was nice seeing the Tiny Toons back and all tiny- that. Yeah, yeah, there's no, you know, uh, bad (laughs) bugs. uh, I'm trying to think what their names were now. Buster Bunny. Buster Bunny is what I (laughs) said. All right. Well, cool. So, yeah, uh, check that out. Highly recommended. Uh, Super, super fun. That is Teen Titans Go to the Library. Kirby. Next up, I got La Casa Nostroid. From the Underworld of Scud the Disposable Assassin, book one from 1996. Uh, I've only got, I've read a few teasers of Scud. I got some of the books, but I just haven't read them yet. And I figured what the heck, I came across this. I check this out first. Scud's not in it. <laughs> they talk about Scud a lot. Like they're hunting for him, but you don't really, you don't see that character at all. But this is more of a mafia style story. I love how they did it because in the beginning, uh, in the cover, they got a whole, if you were going to make a movie of this, these are the actors we'd want playing these different characters. And they got a nice uh, song 
set layout for it. So if you want to have music playing in the background while you're reading the book. So that was nice to see. Uh, soundtrack, I suppose I should have said. But it starts out with some bad cops in New York, 1996, shooting someone, planting guns on them. I know some of the stuff, the language and stuff probably wouldn't fly as well today. But we start out with the basic story of Anthony Farina, a young mob kid and growing up in a mob family. And he's got this addiction with biting people biting people's faces, biting, biting everything. So his dad gives him the name Tasty Tony. <laughs> That's his future mob name. That was my nickname in high school, too. <laughs> yeah, it fits. <laughs> but yeah, he goes through doing whatever, doing the gang stuff, getting, having the conflicts with the other factions out there ends up getting busted for some stuff and thrown in jail. Uh, we bounce around from <laughs> we go from New York, we go to Fort Kilmer in Neo Dells, Wisconsin in 2024. We jump over to Sandwich Land, Hawaii, and it just goes all over the place. We get a few different places in Wisconsin that are all parody, just fake places. Uh, we bounce Pretty much from the 90s to the 2020s, it goes all over the place, just showing what Tasty Tony's been going through and uh, what he's dealing with inside the prison. His cellmates, this very bulked up character that's got like a mechanical jaw face and like a one of his hands is like a mechanical jaw and I don't know. I'm not sure. His name's Chuck Brown. He comes from uh, the Grittites corporate or group. So I don't know who they are or if they have any association in the Scud. I would assume a lot of these bigger characters would have Scud, the disposable assassin. Assassin. Uh, <laughs> organize it. They work they're in his books too, these characters, I'm assuming, but I don't know enough about them. But <clears throat> there's an organization where they're going around trying to stop the other organization and they go to all these different places like strip joints, bars, and just go into these secret vaults and come out with these giant robots and basically pull off a Thundercats style robot where all the parts join together and they use that to battle their enemies along the way there's a picture of the thing forming one giant robot but yeah this was fun and I'm not big on the mafia stories but this had a lot of parody stuff it parodied like Thundercats and some other things from like the 80s and Meeting this Tony character, I want to know more about him. He's got to, got to have something in the Scud world, something to do with it. But I just don't know enough about it. But, but yeah, they did a pretty good job whipping this out, and I like how they had all those little suggestions for people lineups for the soundtrack and all that in here. And then they got all their little promo stuff in the back, selling their T-shirts and all that stuff too. But yeah, I'm going to have to definitely check out more of the Scud and see where these characters lie and find out more about them. Cool. All right. If you are watching the video version of this, you're probably going to think, all right, the next topic is D&D. &D, so what's Jim going to talk about? <laughs> oh, instead, Katie has something D&D &D related. What is it? Yes, that's right. This week I have Saturday Morning Adventures Dungeons and Dragons number one and two from IDW. This appears to be an all ages comic uh, featuring the characters from the 1980s Dungeons and Dragons cartoon. It's written by David M. Boer and Sam Maggs, art by George Cambadias, uh, letters by Ed Dukeshire, and the edits are by Zach Boone and Jonathan Manning. It's uh, $3.99 and it's published by IDW. So, um, 
I've seen a few episodes of the cartoon, and I don't think you need to have seen it at all to understand this. It's a group of kids transported to the worlds of the Forgotten Realms, going on adventures. Um, in case you you they have a splash page laying out all the characters and what their names are and their strengths and what they were like in the real world and now how they're living in the Forgotten Realms. So we have Bobby, who's a barbarian, Diana, who's an acrobat, Festo, who is a magician, Uni, who is a baby unicorn. Sheila, who's a thief, Hank, who's a ranger, and Eric, who is a cavalier knight. So uh, it opens up with they're having a long rest at their campsite after fighting some bad guys. The dungeon master, who is a uh, a character in this story, actually just called the dungeon master, shows up, gives them kind of some vague, cryptic pep talk about like, oh, you should rest now because, you know, you never know when you're going to need it. So he's setting up the next adventure. And... um. Hank is like, you know, I kind of want to, you know, start thinking about going home, you know, going back to the human world. And the other kids are like, well, you know, what if we're stuck here? And I mean, if we go back, we're just going to be in like ninth grade again. You know, the, we're here. We're heroes. And um, they're having some disagreements about that. And they're weighing the pros and cons when all of a sudden some bad guys attack. Um, we have some flying squid monsters um, and a... a a drider, which is a spider with a spider body and a person torso, um, fighting the kids. And one of the characters opens, or nope, a portal opens just out of the blue. So the kids run through and they're going to try and escape. And they're like, oh, okay, maybe we're finally going back to our world now. They land in Waterdeep, which is, you know, still within the D&D world. Um, so this portal crosses spaces but not dimensions that we can tell and it ends with a young lady saying it worked it finally worked and then tune in next time and then the last third of the book is cover pages and ads um <laughs> which is not necessarily a bad thing but i'm like this was a little short um i did google it looks like idw has been going through some business troubles like pretty major ones so um i get why they're selling ads um and then issue two uh, our adventure starts in Waterdeep, where they go into this secret, spooky monastery tower that this young lady lives in, and they find out that she's trapped there because she was born with wild magic, which is um, magic usually from the fey plane that a person has like an innate ability to use, but not necessarily control. It's a little different than if you have a, a sorceress origin, which is you're born with it or you made a pact uh, with a demon. Well, sometimes a pack with a demon that also gets into warlock territory or a wizard who studies it, like, you know, like Harry Potter wizards. So she can't leave this tower. It's full of magical artifacts, which the kids are all geeking out about. But they're also like, where the heck did all this come from? Um, the young lady has a wild magic surge, which opens up portals that bring in a bunch of gelatinous cubes, which are big, giant cubes made of jello that um, eat you and trap everything in their path. <laughs> So uh, two of the kids are like, forget it, you know, like, I don't want to deal with this anymore. And they end up falling into a trap. They did not check for traps. You always check for traps and don't split the party. Um, so you know something's going to go down. They fall into the dungeon and they have this great line. I'd say this is the basement, but it looks more like a dungeon. The real question is, where's the dragon? Oh. And then again, we had the last third of the book um, with ads and cover pages. Um, IDW and to the staff at IDW, I hope if you are going through something that you're able to uh, either secure more funding or or find other jobs that will keep you in the comic industry because layoffs and restructuring suck. Um, so let's talk some pros and cons. So one pro, this book is $3.99, which to me is the exact right price for an all ages or a kid's comic. Um I, I just feel like reading and engaging with the written word and storytelling is so essential. And we know it really helps children develop. And like the better you can read, the more job opportunities you're going to have, which, you know, are a reality of our society. So I never want someone to feel like, well, I can't buy this book for my kid because I need this money to do something else. I would say three ninety nine dollars is within most people's budget. In fact, if I were at the store and you're like, I can't. I would buy it for your kid. Um, so that's a pro. I think it's a good price. 
the paper is really solid. This is better than the regular printer paper, which again, I also feel like kids comics need to be a little bit more durable just because, you know, they don't have as much motor control and most kids aren't looking at it a perspective of, oh, I want to, you know, collect this and save this. They're, they're kids. They read it with, with a little more enthusiasm than us adults do. Um, I thought it was just a, a very cute adventure, a big jump going from once upon a time at the end of the world to this. This is very G-rated. There's nothing it, uh, you'd have to work to find something that this would not be okay for. I'd be all right giving this to uh, eight-year-olds and up. Uh, certainly, I think it'd be good for tweens to read on their own. Um, uh, very wholesome overall. The There's minimal violence, and it doesn't seem like anyone really gets hurt. Um, so there's a ton of D&D comics, and there's a lot of awesome ones for older teens and adults. But they're all, you know, combat is a feature of D&D, so there's a fair amount of violence. When you start getting into things like critical role, you're getting some more bad language or sexual content or um, alcohol consumption, right? The old, the the joke about, oh, your party meets up in a tavern and with, with the books that have higher ratings, obviously they're able to do that. It's meant for that audience, but I could see why you're like, I don't want my, my second grader reading that, right? And this, I feel like is a great entree for younger D&D fans. Um, if you've watched the cartoon and you really enjoyed it, I bet you'll probably get some good nostalgia feels from this. If you haven't, it's it's like Scooby-Doo, but in the Forgotten Realms. A bunch of kids have, have special powers and they're fighting bad guys and saving the planet and such. Um, I enjoyed it. I Like I said, I do think it's probably better suited for kids and families. Anyone can get something out of this. And if you're like, I don't want to read that kid's crap, there's a ton of great D&D comics out there that I'm sure you'll find something you're enjoying. Um, if little eight-year-old me who, you know, was reading Harry Potter and Artemis Fowl and Narnia and all that got her hands on these comics, she would have loved them. And, um, you know, I got something out of it, too. Anyway, that's my review of Dungeons & Dragons Saturday Morning Adventures, issues one and two. Check it out and roll for initiative. Excellent. All right, the next book I'm talking about here is from a creator that I've followed several times. I'm talking about uh, Maul Goth. All right, Liv is not exactly thrilled to be moving to a new town with her mother. After all, high school can be brutal, even more so when you're a 15-year-old bisexual goth. But Liv is determined to be who she is, bullies or not. Still, being the new kid and the only out student brings her a lot of unwelcome attention and Liv flounders in her search for community. The only person who makes time for her is one of the teachers, but Liv isn't sure how to feel about the way he behaves toward her. Thankfully, she's found the perfect escape, the mall. Under its fluorescent lights, Liv feels uh, far away and from her parents' strained marriage and the peers who don't understand her. Amid the bright storefronts, food court smell, and anonymous shoppers, Liv is safely one of the crowd and can enjoy the feeling of calling the shots in her own life for once. With the help of a suburban refuge, Liv sets off on a journey of self-acceptance and learns to uh, learns to navigate the ups and downs of high school and to recognize true friendship. This is done by Kate Leth, Diana Souza, and Robin Crank. Um, Kate, I've checked out their work through, I think I've talked about Spell on Wheels, which is a fun witch book, like kind of road trip witch book. Uh, they did some work on, um, Patsy Walker, the Hellcat, an awesome, uh, series that, uh, Marvel did as well. I met Kate, uh, years back at the, one of the Chicago conventions. So anytime their name pops up, I am excited to check this out. This one came out last fall. I will mention before I go into the review here, because it is a warning at the top here, a note from the author. Uh, this book is a work of fiction inspired by real events. If you or a young person you know is experiencing unwanted attention from an adult, speak up until someone listens. You can find more information and resources at rain.org. That's R-A-I-N-N dot -N org. So going yes. into the story about Liv, uh, we see Liv and her family moving to a, uh, a new town. Uh, while it looks unappealing there's a lot of woods just kind of wondering where are we going here um Liv immediately kind of perks up 
when they drive past this giant mall. And that can definitely be pretty exciting. I myself enjoy uh, a mall or two. Uh, they're coming a little more scarce uh, these days. And uh, so anytime I get to be around one, it's fun to, uh, there, there was times that I would have like, when I had a, like a regular set day off, I would mm -hmm. always go to the mall, bring a stack of books and I would just sit there and read. I'd go to different spots. I would go to a bunch of different shops, hit up the food court, go back to read. So I like, I, I would make the, uh, one of our local malls basically like hanging out all day and buy the new DVDs. I think it, it must've been on a Tuesday then. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I, and once I saw that the mall was kind of a central point in the story, I was excited to check this out. Um, as we go through the story of Liv here, we find out that her father is away on business a lot. And you get the vibe throughout the story that Liv's father is basically never at home and always has these promises of being home for the weekend or this or that, and then having to cancel and ultimately let down um, his daughter to the point where she's just like, oh, yeah, this is, you know, I should have known, you know. So you kind of get that uh vibe throughout the whole story um you see a little bit of tension between Liv and the mother and a lot of that's definitely come from the home life with uh, the father being there and not being there rather um and then starting a brand new school and jumping into this classroom uh where brand new school year at the same time and a bunch of the kids basically introduce themselves and list two things about them and there's other kids that are naming things that are very, uh, uh, very much of Liv's interest when it talk, talks about whether it's gaming or being in a band or this and that. And uh, she quickly kind of finds a group that she is kind of intrigued with, but is still very hesitant to uh, join. And throughout the story, you kind of realize the backstory of what happened at her past school, past group of friends, and why she is hesitant to make new ones. And a lot of that is coming from, uh, as they mentioned in the uh, synopsis, with uh, Liv being bisexual. And there is a button that she wears. It's kind of a theme that's throughout. It's in the on the book and in the inside cover page and stuff. She wears this uh, pin that I just want to highlight here. It, it says, dip me in chocolate and throw me to the lesbians. So <laughs> Liv is wearing this on her backpack. And... <laughs> the story opens up with that oh. i think it's on the inside yeah it's right there on the title page and i'm like please oh. tell me you can buy that from her merch shop that's hilarious i'll say that kate has i know has done some like sticker runs and this and that with like their own designs and stuff so i need to go and check out to see if this is there because <laughs> i would totally throw that on my backpack that's awesome um but that becomes a part of the story too because people you know start assuming being like all right, um, you know you're into you're into girls, aren't you? And and she kind of gets hesitant on when people kind of bring that up because based on her past, she knows that when friends and other classmates and everybody finds out, uh, other people at the prior schools did not take that very well, and she was basically you know left without friends. So even though she proudly has that. Uh, there's still part of her that she, you know, is very defensive and everything. And this story is doing a good job of dealing with that, of of finding the trust in the people, people who are going to accept you for who you are. Uh, the mall stuff in the story, you know, her getting a job at the mall, finding a friend in the mall that actually works mall security, that is a friend with uh, um, with her mother. And and then there is a uh, another fellow goth girl that works at the it's kind of like your GameStop type of store. I forget the name of the store in here. Um, but these group of kids are all kind of bonding over an online game, much like something that feels like, you know, very RPG, very World of Warcraftian type of deal. It's all fake names for the sake of legal things. So they have a whole new franchise in here. Uh, but that is a big source of... Uh, where she starts to open up and find her friendships. The other part that I will touch on, but not too much just for the sake of reading the book for yourself, uh, is based on the warning that the author gives. Um, in the synopsis, they do mention that uh, there is a teacher at school um, that you know she does connect with and 
to the point where she's kind of questioning just, uh, you know, how, how involved this teacher is when, when talking to her outside of school. Um, this story takes place in the early 2000s, and they've mentioned it a couple times about uh, how they have this, e they're in infiltrating this, or instigating, I think is the right term, this, uh, this email system, so to let people know about like the weather alerts and things like that. Now, what I recently found out is that what parents get texts, I think, uh, get texts that if there's like schools closed, whereas you know, me and I'm sure a lot of other people here would just, you know, you turn on the news and you watch mm -hmm. the ticker along the bottom and just wait for your county and your, your school yep. called and like, yes. yes, but you know, <laughs> they're talking about how they have a messages, messaging system within emails and stuff like that. And there is a moment when this teacher quote unquote mistakenly sends her an instant message throughout this like school connection and that just kind of leads to an outside of school uh conversation that kind of continues throughout the book once again you know there, a lot of what i'm saying here is just kind of given the overall you know slightly expanding what i mentioned the synopsis i'm not going to go further but uh i think it's very important to have that warning that the author gave uh saying that this you know book is while it's a work of fiction uh, but it is based on true events. So I can only imagine, uh, you know, what went down to kind of fuel this very important story that Kate uh, put out there in the world. And uh, yeah, so that is what I'm going to say for that. This is recommended for ages 12 and up. I think there's one F-bomb in here. You know, it's, uh, I would say that age range is probably pretty appropriate and probably a good way to read. You know, it's a probably ultimately a good informational source when you see, the stuff that goes down in here and how the characters react, it's its almost kind of what that opening, you know, warning does is that it just kind of gives you the information just being like seeing how a victim starts to take the blame and feeling like they're the one that has the problem. And you see a lot of that in the story and you see, thankfully, with the supporting characters letting this character know that, uh, you know, you're doing the right thing and you should definitely say something and... You know, you are not at all at fault. And, you know, there are people in the school system that are there to protect you, you know, and that's as much as, you know, that should be going beyond that to the extent of what's going on in the story. So I think it does, I think it is good for an age group like that, where uh, even though it's something taking place, you know, over 20 years ago already, but I think there's a lot of themes and stuff in here that is very much for, you know, anybody at any given time. So this was an excellent read. Um, it got very heavy. It was a lot of fun with a lot of the, you know, the internet uh, friendships when it comes to their gaming and stuff like that. And just, you know, a lot, lot of drama that's going on in there. But ultimately, I thought it was a very good story to tell a very strong message coming from the author who, um, you know, gave the warning and knew a lot about the topic. So. That is all I'll say about Malgoth. This is from um, Simon and Schuster. And yeah, and once again, anytime Kate releases something, my uh, attention is there in the catalog. And this is uh, no excuse. This also fits into that realm of happily put this on my shelf. So that is Malgoth by Kate Leth and others. All right, jump over to Kirby. I got from AWA, Lesser Evils, from the Tribeca Festival from 2022, which I thought I bought this, which I might have and just haven't read it, because once I read it, I don't recall any of these stories, and I think I would have, but who knows, I could have reviewed it a couple of years ago, and this is fresh to me, <laughs> but uh, this is writer, artist, and director is Ian Grody, Yishin Lee, and Justin Fair. And there's a variety of other collaborators in this. But we basically get three stories out of this. Our first story is Emmett, which is about a girl that is into doing pottery. And all of a sudden, this she meets some people. She basically deals with things that are frustrating her and stuff, and she 
It's like her boyfriend that she first has that kind of leaves her, and and he kind of does it kind of rudely. Uh, sets up a whole thing where he they go on a date at like a cafe, I think it is, and he breaks up with her, and the his new girlfriend's right there. This is the old girlfriend. This is the new girlfriend. So the dirt bag just basically dumps her and then meets up with this this chick meets him at the restaurant and they go off and leave her so she gets mad she goes home trashes a bunch of stuff of his and just has this outburst where she just screams and all of a sudden lightning starts rumbling all this things happening so he mentions that he has certain types of powers as he's leaving her and then she does this event that Looks like she has some type of powers, but never really jumps back to those powers. So I don't know if it was just an event that happened at that time. But from these powers, she gets this new friend, this clay man character that's hanging out with her. Is this this clay blob type character. Hangs out with her. They go around. He's telling her that he can basically has some special powers and abilities and he can do things and they just keep messing with her ex-boyfriend. I don't want to get deeper in here to say what overall happens, but there's a little interesting make out with our blob session with the blob character and stuff and kind of a Howard the Duck kind of play from the movie <laughs> it kind of made me feel like that back in the day <laughs> but yeah it was just fun watching her go through this using his this creature to help her out and then her kind of punishing the creature because it gets the creature goes a little too far with so his abilities and things work out in the end in a certain way and just it was a real enjoyable story and does jump over to like a black and white story towards the end uh, giving us a little extra look at how it was the story was laid out and gives you the feel of everything how the artist was thinking what their plan was with it uh, the next story is a way longer story this one takes up most of books but that was good because this was uh, my favorite story out of, I, I love them all but this one I really enjoyed because I'm not big into the genie thing but this is a guy named Jin and he's got kind of an idiot for his owner at the present time. This guy gets all wasted one night and says, I'm going to set you free. He sets the genie free. Genie goes off and just tries to uh, live his life, see what happens. And we have this whole thing with him and this bartender, which is nice. Apparently, every day he goes to this bar, and his name's Gin. He's got a gin and tonic uh, addiction. That's his main drink of choice. He'll sit at this bar, get completely wasted, tell the bartender all these stories, and then he'll wipe the bartender's mind at the end of the night so he doesn't remember anything about the genie stuff and all that. But he meets this girl while he's away from... Uh, free from his last last master which he mentions he talks about some of the old masters that he's had over the years and how he looks this guy is one of the worst ones he's dealt with uh the things he's had to do for this guy but when he meets this girl uh she happens to have a make a wish shirt on she she works for a make a wish foundation some things happen to her one of her family members And then she joined up to help out the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And you can imagine with him being a genie, things that happen, she drags him into the mace. Well, (laughs) he basically throws up on her nice new new shoes at the beginning of their meetup. Not really a relationship yet. And she's like, he, he feels bad. He's trying to make up for it. She's like, well, you can come to work with me and you can spend a day with the Make-A-Wish kids and stuff. And 
he gets to see that side of society and kind of does some fun things to help with the kids, which is really nice and helps one kid whose father basically the poor kid's about to die anyways. And the father feels so bad about it. He doesn't want to hang with the kid or be around the kid. And the genie kind of makes him get whispers in his ear. And next thing you know, you see the kid and his dad enjoying uh, the next, well, <laughs> the make-a-wish lady happen to get the kid the next season of Mandalorian, but they have to destroy the tape after he's done watching it. So it's not coming out yet. And he's addicted to Star Wars. So there's a nice little thing in there with that. I really, really liked what they did with that part of the storyline. But then you got, of course, the guy comes back, so realizes, oh, I screwed up. I was drunk. I wasn't thinking right. I was on, on these drugs and stuff, and I accidentally let you go. I want you back. And, and then you got to read the story to see where it goes. But I'd really like to see it. I'm going to have to search. I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to have to search to see if they have more stories with the Jin character. I'm hoping. I'm assuming since this is kind of like a teaser thing that all three of these ha have story. Oh, there's actually four that are mentioned because you got this tales book also they have in the back and then it just shows kind of like a location in Brooklyn, New York, where all these characters are located. So I assume they all have their own thing. And they do have a thing back here. Welcome to Brooklyn through the looking glass where a golem with benefits, a spiraling genie, a demon who feeds on bad vibes and a promising young mermaid collide with heartbroken, hard living, hype obsessed humans. Lesser evils is a hilarious pop culture filled universe that explores what in intimacy, spite, selfless, selflessness and friendship mean today. And then our, so yeah, I guess we do have, I think that four story just had like one or two pages. That's why that, because this gin story is basically takes up the whole book but then our thrifter story we got these two girls they go out and they buy they pick up things from thrift stores and resell them on ebay and All right. the one of the girls comes across this weird looking little tree guy and the other girl doesn't like it being in their shop and they put it up for sale and all that and try and sell it and then some things happen also they notice the tree characters growing a little bit and then all of a sudden uh the one girl that hates it all of a sudden the next morning it ends up in her apartment now we see these things that this tree's doing to the girls and messing with them and it's basically one of those evil symbol type things that you just gotta watch what you wish for because you never know what's gonna happen there's the our wooden totem is a giant creature in this picture. Uh, it's just, yeah, it's interesting what they end up doing with that. It's basically like a Chucky story to me. It's uh, every time you try and get, destroy or throw away the skull or the, the little dude, he just keeps coming back <clears throat> wherever, wherever he needs to be to torment whoever doesn't like him being around. But yeah, that's what that has to do with it. And then Tails just gives you a tiny little teaser of the person that's part of that. But I don't know where that's going to go. But I do want to definitely check out at least a couple of these books if they are ongoing. But that's from the 2022 Tribeca Festival. And yeah, I could have swore I got this book before, but I must must never read it. And I've seen it at half price books for 50 cents. So grabbed another copy of it <laughs> there we go um we do have one more pick and that will be kirby but as you prep that one i want to do a follow-up on asking you about uh kate less merchandise um okay. unfortunately i do not see that in there so i don't know if that was a limited <laughs> thing or maybe right. a patreon thing but what i found out is that they have several shops of so many goodies of designs <laughs> and quotes and this and that so i'm just going to highlight a couple um because i think i'm going to do some shopping um i'm not particular buying these ones but maybe some of them there's one shirt that just says uh part girl all daddy um <laughs> part girl all daddy um there's some with uh, little bats and ghost uh pins Aww. so there's some cute little pins there Very um, nice. 
She has a temporary, I think these were the temporary tattoos or a sticker sheet of pizza and witch related items. Um, there's a lot Very of cat, creative. there's a lot of cat stuff, including this one that says, I don't want to be here. And then just has a, a drawing of a cat. So there's a lot of different cat things that are pretty funny. There's one that says, oops, you brought up my special interest. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of fun little catchphrases. There's two more. This one says, tired of men and horny for monsters. So, yep, yeah, just moving from men to monsters. Okay. And then the la uh, last one I'm highlighting, it says, please don't ask me about Taylor Swift unless you have at least 45 minutes and an open mind. So, <laughs> so there we go. Um, there's a lot oh of my stuff. Goodness. Uh, just find Kate Leth, L-E-T-H, um, on Instagram. And there's a link to an Etsy shop and other shops. And I think I got to do some shopping because there's some cool prints and stuff too. And so anyways, want to give that follow up on there. Um, jump over to Kirby for our last review. All right. I have no idea what this is. <laughs> we got what men comic book. Basically, if you're a fan of the Watchmen, you'll love this book <laughs> because I still don't understand the Watchmen <laughs> fully. I read it. I've watched it. All that stuff. Read this. Don't understand what I read, but basically your characters that are all parodied off our Watchmen characters are being hunted down and killed off. Uh, <laughs> they have all kinds of fun things like the guy that slips on a smiley face soap and ends up killing himself. <laughs> so we got our naked character that just Doctor they play with all his... Well, <laughs> of course, all the images I'm finding now are his upper half, but yeah, they Constantly played with all his images, throwing something in front of his thing, little plants and all that stuff. Uh, and even the writers themselves in here make some comments that they don't understand what the heck that, that Watchmen's actually about and what the what they were reading back in the day, and they just parodied off the best they could. Uh, this also jumped around to different styles art images going to more cartoony stuff and we get little things interviews from the writers in here that give you some fun little parodies off the stories this parodied off a lot of other things from back in the day uh it's just it was fun seeing all these characters going through what they're doing and watching them getting hunted down and seeing them help each other out but I really didn't get a complete storyline of what I was reading in here. You had a little quote from uh, Tony Soprano in here. You had the watchmaker, watchmaker, make me a watch thing going on. You had all kinds of little bios that pop up in here. And it's, yeah, it was just as confusing as the original to me. Uh, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it more than the original because, of course, the goofy parody parts of it. They liked playing with Kelvin and Hobbes things in here. They liked throwing those images into it and stuff. But, but yeah, it's... Publish that. Uh, this was done by IDW. Oh. Okay. It's like when I seen the logo on the front, it looked, but yeah, it's because it's cut in half. That's why. Because I wasn't sure. But yeah, IDW did this. Did you just it pick was up put that out randomly, or did you find that in the catalog, or what? No, this was in my crates of comics. So I have no idea where I came across this. It's from 2009. Okay. So it's not that old, but yeah, huh. it's respectfully dedicated and with apologies to Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons. <laughs> and a, th a special thanks to Dan Duncan in here and stuff. Just, yeah, it, it was, it was fun and interesting, but I enjoyed it way more than the original Watchmen, but yeah, it's, <laughs> I love a good parody and the, this one does a, does a good job playing with a bunch of different things in here. So, yeah, uh, I had never heard of that, but yeah, that's uh... <laughs> There's a newspaper clipping of all the characters that they run with in here. 
Nice. <laughs> well, now that title makes sense when I remember reading that, just being like, what is this? <laughs> yeah, that's why I had to put down. It is three different books. Because there's no real number or anything with it. It's just a question mark and exclamation. <laughs> okay. Well, then that is going to do it for our show. A uh, little um, uh, house cleaning, I think is the right term. Uh, we won't have a show for uh, Saturday, February 10th. Because myself, David Gloyd, and David Gloyd II will be at Milwaukee MightyCon. Go to MightyConShows.com for the information on that. They're going to be selling their comic book. They're going to be selling original art, some leftover collectibles and comics and such from the uh, old Crimson Cowl storefront. I will be there with my uh, usual ta table set up with my 11 by 17 poster prints of my digital work. Uh, tons of four by six sketches, uh, more sketch cards, um, some bookmarks. I think I'm at like a point where I'm selling, I think like a hundred items. Like I have a hundred items with all like the original drawings and stuff. So it's kind of crazy that I've uh, got quite a, quite a bit of inventory. So I just keep adding to it day by day. So you can see us at Mighty Con Milwaukee, Saturday, February 10th. Because of missing that week, and with the previews falling, like should be out in stores now with the catalogs and such. When we come back, we'll probably just do all the previews in uh, one episode to make up for a lost week. So I just wanted to do that little house cleaning while I had that in mind. I added another event that I'm going to be attending solo, another comic verse event, which I just went to the New Berlin Alehouse one, which was a ton of fun. And they're doing another one, uh, but this time at Lucky Dogs in Nina, Wisconsin. Uh, that's over in Green Bay Road. Um, uh, the our office and news team handed me this uh, breaking news here, so I have this I have this news to read. So yeah, it's a comic convention and toy show Sunday, March tenth, twenty twenty four. 10 to 3. It's at Lucky Dogs with a Z. Um, $3 admission. Kids 12 and under are free. And I will be there selling my art. Whatever's left over uh, from MightyCon. Alright, so that is those plugs for upcoming appearances. Go to CrimsonCowl.com for all the information uh, that is there, including free web comics. Um, Crimson Cowl Comic Club on iTunes for the audio version. Subscribe, rate, and review. Crimson Cowl Comic Club on YouTube. If you're listening to the audio version and you want to see the stuff that we're showing off, whether it's the covers, some of the pages, uh, some of the things that we're referencing within each other's windows, uh, go ahead and subscribe to Crimson Cowl Comic Club over on YouTube to get the full experience. Um, then the Crimson Cowl, all, all one word on Instagram, Crimson Cowl Comic Club at yahoo.com if you want to reach out to us, send an email for uh, any maybe some fun questions that we can all answer or maybe some um, questions about things that we've talked about or recommendations on things to read. Check us out, Crimson Cowl Comic Club at yahoo.com. Kirby has a spinoff podcast called Under the Cowl of MS. Kirby, what is going on over there uh, or what's coming up in the future? Still working on reviews and previews and stuff like that, but kind of slacking a little bit this week. So I was working on some computer stuff. So hopefully we'll have some more stuff out in the upcoming weeks. Cool, cool. Plus a lot of uh, newer, shorter review segments over on uh, Instagram. And I think some of the videos go on Facebook too, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I have it set up where as long as I'm using my phone, it'll do Instagram and Facebook. But for some reason, it doesn't do it when I use my laptop. So, yeah, we have a limited amount of time uh, to uh, you know, review books. We kind of pick some of our, you know, a couple of the favorites throughout the week. But if you check out Under the Call of MS, you get lots more comic book reviews and other stuff. So check that out wherever you get your audio podcast as well as YouTube. I have some art accounts on Facebook and Instagram at Anthony Latch, L-A-A-T-S. C-H. Check out the things that I've been posting. I have almost a daily drawing. I'm I'm weeks ahead and it gets to the point where I just like I'm still posting things that I drew from 2023. So I got a lot of things and so there's a lot of art that's happening. So it's almost daily posting. Um, and then uh, Cartoonist by Night on YouTube is a show that I host alongside my creative friends Troy Dungara, Matt Fife, Matt Rogers, and frequent guest D. Brad Gibson, 
And we had a very special guest on, on an episode that I will be editing. Uh, by the time you see this episode and hear it, um, it'll probably be out, uh, assuming no mistakes happen. But we had Brian Lynch, who was a former guest on the Crimson Cowl Comic Club. You can go back and check out his interview talking all about Hot Wing of Justice, Harold and his Hot <laughs> Wing of Justice, as well as that crazy pumpkin character that... Um, I get so much enjoyment out of that character. So we welcome Brian onto the show to talk about everything that he's been doing. But he picked the topic, and I had to basically prove to the other members that I did not give Brian any money to choose the topic <laughs> on specific because without any you know input from me, Brian picked the Muppets. So hey. I was, I'm like, all right, I think, uh, I think I could probably do something with the Muppets. So um, that'll be an episode on Cartoonist by Night. Check out that feed and uh, that'll hopefully be dropping right around the time of this one. Um, yeah, I think that covers it for all the plugs. Another great episode. Once again, we'll be taking a week off, which will be a perfect time to go and check out everything from Under the Cowl of MS. Check out some of our back creator interviews, watch the episodes of Cartoonist by Night. And uh, yeah, I think that will do it. This whole time, I've been dipped in chocolate and thrown into the lesbians. I've been dazed and confused. I've been eaten by a gelatinous cube. Where the rat balls have you been? <laughs> to be continued. <laughs> Thank you, Slimer.